If you would, take your copy of the scriptures and open with me to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, we'll be reading verses 2 through 7. There we read, I plead with Eodia, and I plead with Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we are so grateful for the opportunity to be here today with our brothers and sisters in Christ as the family of God. Lord, we know not everyone here is even officially a member of this church, but Lord, we know being a part of your family is way more than church membership. That Lord, if we have professed our faith in you, we belong to your family, for you have given us the right to be called the children of God. Lord, we know that being a part of your family means that we have the opportunity, like other families, to practice patience, to practice forgiveness, to practice grace. So Lord, we pray today that as we study your word, that you would give us instruction on how to do just that. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I know we have a lot of the kids with us today, that today's not a day where we have children's church. We've got the children here in big church with us. Uh, If you're a kid, I want you to lean over to your mom or dad or grandmother and say, Pastor Taylor loves it when I'm in big church. Can you say that to him? Go ahead. And so if, if I get it, they move around, they make a little noise. So here's a, I want you to say something else to your, pa- your parents or your grandparents. Lean over and say, if I make noise, a little bit of noise, Pastor Taylor's okay with that. All right? Go for it. <laughs> See, I love kids being in church because we learn together. And today, especially, I need the kids' help because this sermon is really, it's not just about kids, but kids are going to help us get into this sermon a little bit because it's about little kids and big kids all together uh, about the fact that sometimes we don't always get along. So I know it's summertime, right? We're four or five weeks into summertime, depending on when your school let out. So if you're a kid and you normally go to school, but it's summertime and you're not in school right now, I want to show of hands. If you have already been swimming this summer, raise your hand. That's, That's good. That's good. If you have already played video games during the hours in which you would have been in school, raise your hand. Okay, if you've already been on a vacation or a trip to see a grandparent because it's summertime, again, during time where you would normally be in school, raise your hand. Okay, so all these fun things are happening during school. So if you're a kid, I want to answer from the kids here, not the parents, the kids. How many of you are already ready to go back to school? I got one or two, but not very many. The majority are definitely not. Now, I want to shift gears just a bit. Parents. We are four to five weeks into summer. How many of you have at least in the inner monologue of your own head said, I am ready for school to start? Let me see it. <laughs> a few more, a few more. And I guess, my guess is if, it's, if, it's, if your house is like my house, it's because there's a moment where, where you're enjoying all the summertime bliss. You're, you're at the pool, you're, you're playing a game with your kids, you're at grandma's house. It's one of those perfect moments where you think, this is just how life should be, and then inevitably, what happens? It's like at my house, it comes from the back seat of the car. You looked at me wrong, stop that, quit, turn around. Mom, tell him to stop looking at me. How many of you have already been there this summer? It's in those moments. We're deep in a parent's heart. We have a longing, much like the Bible teaches us to long for the day of the coming of the Lord. We long for school to return because our children cannot get along. Now, kids, I want you to look at your parents and say, Pastor Taylor knows even grown-ups have trouble getting along. That's right, and we find two of those grown-ups in our passage today. If you're looking for baby names, we've got two ladies' names, Eodia and Syntyche. They're beautiful names. 
We, we don't know too much about them, uh, but they are in the church at Philippi. They are co-workers with Christ. Paul has worked on them, uh, worked with them and sharing the good news uh, with other people. And for some reason, we don't know why, they are struggling to get along. Now, we don't think they are actual biological sisters. We, we don't have any indication of that, but they are in many ways acting like sisters. And this is what happens, right? When we find anyone with whom we are dear friends, someone we, we spend a lot of time together in a church family or another setting, we don't have to be biologically related to them to begin treating them like family. I remember a time in my life where I had gone off to college. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. And my very best friend, childhood best friend, uh, we, we, we grew up together. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, but when we did that, we would go home to our individual homes at the end of the day. But, but at college, we were rooming together. All of a sudden, we were friends who had to figure out how to live together. And, and, and TR, that's his name. We're, we're going to go see him in a little bit. He's a, a physician, but he's taking a year off work to do medical missions in Nicaragua. And we're going to go visit him. A dear friend we've kept up through the years, but when we lived together, our friendship, I know you find this hard to believe, our friendship at times became a little strained. TR was one of those guys, well, let's just call him a neat freak. Can we call him that? That's who TR is. It's good. He's a physician now. It's good for your physician to be a neat freak. He was a neat freak even as a, a college student. I was a little more liberal with my clothes being on the floor and things like that. So we would have trouble. But when we frustrated each other, oftentimes, we were good Christian people, but sometimes words would slip from our mouths that we did not mean to say, not cuss words, but occasionally when he really frustrated me, do you know what I would call him? Eric. Do you know who Eric is? My brother. My brother. When TR would drive me crazy, deep from within my soul, my very own brother's name would come forth. Why is that? Because who frustrated me more than any other person in my life up to that point? My brother. Here is the deep truth of this lesson. If you frustrate me enough, I will call you family. That's right. That's right. And this is what happens. Jesus promised us that if we leave mother and father and brother and sister for his sake, that he would add mother and father and brother and sister in our life a hundred times over. That was the great promise of following him, that if we would leave our families to follow him, he would give us an even larger extended family. And the church in Philippi is discovering that. Eodia and Syntyche, they have become sisters. They have become a part of the family of God, but just like any other family on this planet, with that family togetherness comes what? Family friction. And they are not getting along. So Paul has some words of advice for them in this passage. And so whether we are struggling to get along with our biological family or our church family or some other group of people which we have to interact with on a regular basis, that, that Paul's words to these two women help us today to learn what does it mean to get along with one another in the name of the Lord. And this is his very first lesson, is that he looks to these women who are having a disagreement, and he, he pleads with them, first of all. He doesn't ask, he doesn't suggest, but the text tells us that he pleads with them because he knows the danger of family friction. It's not that he's opposed to them having a disagreement. He knows that every family, every grouping of people, if you get together, we have different opinions. And in those different opinions, we're going to have discussions and arguments. That's a part of life. But Paul knows the danger of those moments. He knows that we can go from having a disagreement to having an all-out war with one another uh, almost before we know what's happened. We know that some families are already there, war of words, wars of even violence, wars of abuse, but other families of wars of silence, families who have not spoken to each other in many, many years. Friends, I've lived long enough at this point I know just almost four decades, but long enough to know that if a family makes it to the very end of their lives still liking each other, it is no small miracle. Learning to love each other and to like each other through thick and thin, it takes a lot of work. And Paul understands that. And so he says to these two women whose argument threatens to derail the work of the whole church, we'll see this in just a moment, he says to them, he pleads with them, be of the same mind in the Lord. That's how the newest NIV puts it. A lot of other translations simply say together, uh, say, agree with each other in the name of the Lord. 
In either case, Paul really isn't just saying to them, he's not, he's not asserting his authority, he's not just saying, I'm going to shut you in a room and not let you out until you agree. Hey, that's not it. He, he, he's doing something more because we know how well that works, right? My parents are here today. You know, normally I like to use illustrations and, and they don't always hear about it, but because this church does such a good job of live streaming the services, my parents are watching, so I'm having to be a lot more careful with the illustrations that I use because my mother will hear. But they're here today and, and, and they know when my brother and I would get into arguments as a kid, sometimes they would just force us to be together they would force us to hug and make up and and you know how much we loved that (laughs) and in fact when we had that forced embrace after an argument it didn't do anything to end the argument it just delayed it a little bit (laughs) just caused it to simmer I was reminded that of this week when a friend in San Angelo posted on Facebook about her children they were in the midst of the summer bickering and so she made them go to one bedroom And she took all the devices away, all the things away that they could entertain themselves with and just said, you're just in there until you figure out how to get along. And she closed the door. And and really, like most of the parents, I've learned this now, it's not so much that we're worried about them getting along. We just need a few moments of peace. And so, so she's put them in the room and she's gone to do other things. Well, she eventually walks back by because they are very quiet and we know that can be as dangerous as noise. And so she walks back by and, and there at the door, is a sheet of paper. They have slipped a sheet of paper out from the door. And she thinks, well, maybe it's an apology. Maybe it's a confession. Maybe it's a pleading, you know, uh, for mercy. And she picks it up, and there her children have worked together to write a little note that said, Dear Mom, we do not like being in this room. (laughs) P.S. We don't like you either. And just so she got the point, they drew a picture of a little devil out to the side. <laughs> we know that, that when, when, when we're forced to be together uh, against our wills, it does not always unite us in the spirit of the Lord. Paul here is not asking these two ladies to get together in some sort of way so that he can be the common enemy and unite them in that way. Paul is not trying to unite them through a common enemy. Paul is trying to unite them through a common loyalty. He is reminding these two ladies that whether they realize it or not, they are already together in the Lord. They belong to the one family of God. And so he's calling them to remember that simple truth about the gospel that if we belong to Jesus we belong to his family and the goal of our unity is not always in figuring out who's right or wrong do you notice in this passage that nowhere does Paul even get into the weeds of what the argument was about he he doesn't even try to referee the fight all he does is say agree with one another in the Lord He is not trying to help them figure out who is right or who is wrong. He is trying to remind them of whose they are. They belong to the Lord. And if they're together in the Lord, then they can at least use that as a beginning place for agreement. They don't have to agree on all of the details. They simply can agree that they belong to the one family of God. And because of that, they can begin to work it out. It's interesting because it even calls the rest of the church together. This, this reminds us of how important it is for us to, to seek reconciliation with one another because it, these two ladies could have just said, well, our discussion doesn't involve the whole church, but to Paul, it involved the whole church because he calls some other folks together. One, he, the NIV calls him a, a true companion. It may just be the Greek word is this guy's name. I don't know. It's also the word that can mean yoke fellow, people who are yoked together for a common task. Yes, this person and Clement to intervene. He, he wants the church to figure this out because he knows that if any part of the body is arguing with one another, it can derail the entire mission of the church. What Paul is wanting is for these two women to figure out how to agree in the Lord so that the cause of Christ can continue unhindered. Notice that's the linking point in this passage. He says, look, we've all been working together. He uses the image of co-laborers. An old word for that is yoke fellows. It's the picture of oxen yoked together for a common purpose. He says, we serve a common purpose. We've all been working for that purpose, which is to share the good news, the gospel news of Jesus Christ with the world around us. And Paul is worried that if these two women, these two sisters in Christ can't sort this out, they will harm the church's witness. We can look around the world today and we can see how the church's inability to agree in the Lord Harms our witness. 
too often we have a reputation not for being the one family of God, but by being the fractured family of God, who seem to enjoy arguing with one another more than serving alongside one another in the cause of Christ. Paul wants them to know that as long as they continue to fight in a way that's unhealthy and argue in a way that's unhealthy, they are impeding the work of the church. I wonder today in a more immediate sense, what is your family's goal? Your family doesn't have a common goal? That might be part of the problem. So many of our families exist under the same roof, but we are headed in so many different directions. We all nowadays, what, have our own screens, we're in our own headphones, so that, so that while we may be in the same place, we do not have the same purpose. And because of that, we find ourselves arguing over all manner of things, of priorities and property. We do not find ourselves with one common vision of our family's purpose. What should your family's common purpose be? Well, in some ways, every family's gonna flesh that out a little differently. This may even be a good summer activity when you have exhausted all of those other things, or maybe even before it. When, when your kids say, I'm bored, you can say, I have a good activity for us. And you could sit down together and you could talk about, what does God want from our family? What is our family's purpose? How do we do this together? And, and you could talk about everything from, how are you gonna spend your free time to, to how are you gonna spend your resources? It's good to sit down with our kids every now and then and say, here's our finances and you don't have to go in all sorts of details different families will do that in different ways but you can say here's how we prioritize these things in our lives this is how our children learn and we sit down and we talk about those common things and it's amazing that when you bring your children into those discussions they will often press you in ways you never imagine because they will often buy into your own goals more than you have and when you start talking about vacations and spending money they will call you to task sticking with the family's purpose. Whatever that happens to look like for your family, I hope you'll remember that we were made, all of us, to worship our maker and to make him known. However the specific uh, purpose of your family takes shape, it should include the larger purpose of God's family to worship our maker and to make him known. When we do this, when we do this, we give our family a common purpose which helps us when we have those disagreements, and we will have those disagreements, to have those disagreements within the context of our shared purpose. And that brings us to the next point. Once we have a shared purpose, and it involves worshiping our maker and making him known, then we have to be about that purpose. And so another way to help keep your arguments from becoming full-blown wars is simply to worship together. Philippians 4, 4 and following are some of my favorite passages at verses in the whole Bible. Rejoice in the Lord, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I memorized those verses when I was in the seventh grade. They have stuck with me. But, but I love the fact that this glorious passage, I mean a passage that just soars, the language soars, comes right after Paul has had to say to the two ladies, come on, we've got to get along with one another. Because Paul knows this is the stuff of life. So many people think that church is where we come and we worship and we can forget about everything else. But guess what? That's not the way it works. We come to worship grumpy people. We come to people worship as people who've just had an argument with our spouse. We come to church. I, I know none of your families were like this this morning. Where, where we argue from the moment we leave the door all the way till we get the church's door. And then guess what? We are called to rejoice in the Lord always. And that means even when your family's arguing. In fact, I think it's more important to worship together when your family is arguing because worship is one of the places where we remember we are in the Lord. We gather and we worship together and we get a glimpse of this is who we are. We are together in this. Alice and I had the opportunity uh, two weekends ago to go back to A&M to a, a Baptist student ministry reunion. It was a wonderful time. We saw old friends. It, it was like we hadn't been apart. You know, we were together at the, at the Aggie BSM during our college years, and we, we, we got along, and we enjoyed each other's company, and we, we all pulled for the Aggies. We all still have that in common. But, but, you know, we've gone our separate ways. And because of Facebook, we see those separate ways. And you know what? Not everybody that I went to the Aggie BSM still thinks like I do on everything. They probably didn't then, but we were too busy cheering for football games. We didn't get into those discussions. But now with Facebook, I know some of them have voted for different people than I voted for. And I know that some of them have different interests than I. And they go to churches that look different than my church. And I know this never happens with your friends on Facebook, but sometimes what they put on Facebook frustrates me a little bit. 
And, 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 and here we are, all back together. And you know what? It was wonderful. I led a short little devotional, and then one of the guys who led worship at the BSN when we were in college, he led worship. And there we all are back together, worshiping the Lord. And you know what? Those differences melted away. I remembered we are in the Lord. And that's what matters most. When we worship together, it's preemptive. It, 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 it gets in the way of our fights and our arguments becoming full-blown wars because we remember we may not think exactly alike, but we are on the same team. That's why I love worship so much. That's why your family should be in worship on a regular basis. It's why the church should worship together even when they disagree with each other. Because it's hard to keep disagreeing with each other when we're worshiping together. We can work on it. We can switch Sunday school classes. We can sit in a different part of the sanctuary. But you got to really work at it, don't you? And that's why I love the table. Because the table reminds us we are together in the Lord. One of my favorite stories to remember in the New Testament when we come to the table is the story of the prodigal son. Because guess who's the only one not sitting at the table at the end of that story? The older brother who refused to sit down with his younger brother because he disagreed with him. God, in his grace, has saved us all a seat at his table. And the only one who doesn't have a seat is simply the one who refuses to sit down because they will not sit next to that other person. When we gather for worship, we remember we are in this together, not because we agree on everything, but because we all belong to God in his good grace. So we are a family who worships together. We are a family uh, who, who prays together. Uh, we are a family who is gentle with one another. I, I love this phrase in the middle of this passage, let your gentleness be evident to all. The word translated gentle in the NIV can also be translated forbearance. It's an old word, but we should, it's okay, we can learn old words. Forbearance is this, it's patience, but it's combined with this idea that you may be right but it's not always the right time to assert that you are right. What a countercultural word for us today. Forbearance. We all learned this, right? That in our relationships with one another, we may be right, but now is not always the right time to assert that right. Sometimes we are called to be gentle with one another. That's especially true if you find yourself in the midst of an argument with a sister or brother in Christ. That sometimes when we want to be right, what happens? We end up fracturing the relationship even more. But the calling here to these two ladies, again, Paul's not taking sides, but he is saying to them, be gentle with one another. And notice his motivation, because the Lord is near. I like that. Even when I think of my brother and I fighting when we were younger, you know, we would squabble, and kids have a wonderful way of not even knowing their parents are in the room sometimes, so we keep squabbling. But when we were aware of my mother or father's presence, our behavior would often shift because we knew mom is near. And the truth is, the, the, the promise that the Lord is near, it can be both a warning or a comfort. If we are not doing what we're supposed to, the Lord is near will sound like a warning, won't it? The Lord is near. We used to do that sometimes, my brother and I. I know my mom probably overheard us because kids are never as quiet as they think they are. Mom's coming, quick. We gotta gotta straighten up because we knew we were misbehaving. But there's also something else there. It's also comfort. The Lord is near. The one who has been patient with us, the one who has been gracious with us, the one who has been kind to us, he is near. Let us imitate his graciousness in one another's lives. If God has been so gracious to us, how should we not be just as gracious in one another's lives? One of the ways that you and I can prevent an argument, a disagreement from turning into a full-blown war is by worshiping together and by being gentle with one another. And last, by praying for one another. Isn't this a glorious promise in this passage? Don't be anxious about anything. And what causes us more anxiousness than our relationships with one another? Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, in prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Just like worship. If we worship together, it's hard to stay in an argument with each other. If we pray for the people we are arguing with, it's also difficult to stay angry with them. So it's amazing. We'll go to Facebook. We'll have our few friends on Facebook, and we'll go, you never believe what my husband did. Because we know that they're going to say what to us? I can't believe he did that. And they're going to agree with us. 
We'll go to that or we'll, we'll, we'll go to our favorite blog, you know, that we know the person will, will gripe about people in the same way we like to gripe about people. Or, you know, in the old days we'd write Dear Abby, we're always looking for something, somebody who will agree with us. We'll go to all those places, but we won't go to God. Why not? Because sometimes we know God won't agree with us. If we pray for our enemies, we pray for our spouses who we're arguing with, if we pray for our children who are driving us crazy, God will have a way of changing our hearts through those prayers. And once again, we'll find that our disagreements and our arguments don't turn into full-blown wars. And in the meantime, God gives us a glorious promise. His peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. What causes us more bitterness? What causes us more angst? What causes us more trouble in this life than the broken relationships we have with the people we love the most? Jesus says if we'll pray about those, Paul promises us, if we'll pray about those, the very peace of Christ will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I can't think of a thing our families need more than that. So let us be a people who in our immediate families and in our church family, work really hard at agreeing in the Lord, that we do that by worshiping together, by being gentle with one another, and praying for each other every day of our lives. If we do, God's promises will hold. His peace, which passes understanding, will be ours. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you so much that you have made us a part of your family not because of anything we've done, but because of what you have done for us. So Lord, let us be a people who gladly sit down at your table with everyone that you've invited to be there, for they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.